Hello, and welcome to worship with Cheney United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Alyssa, and along with Pastor Pat, it is my joy to welcome you all to this time of worship. A special welcome to our friends at Manitou UMC who are joining us today. One of the unexpected gifts of this pandemic is the collaboration we've developed with our sister church through worship, through youth group, and who knows what else in the future. So welcome once again. If you're a member of Cheney UMC and you read our newsletter from a couple weeks ago and perhaps even listened to the benediction at the end of last week's service, you might be expecting a service about the Trinity. And that was my plan. But as often happens, the Holy Spirit has other plans for me and my worship leadership. And so today we won't actually be talking about the Trinity, but we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit and particularly the work of the Holy Spirit in this season of our lives. So I beg your forgiveness and give thanks for your understanding. Today, our service will be led by several people, including Valerie and Catherine Schillinger, who will be our worship leaders. And of course, you'll get to enjoy the music of Joanna Cockrum, John Bennett, and Cedric Bidwell-Williams. It is our tradition here at Cheney UMC to start the service with a time of reflection during the prelude. And so I'd like you to take a few moments to think about the times in your life when you have been felt led by the Spirit to do something you weren't sure that you could do without her encouragement. <laughs> Valerie Schillinger and this is Katherine Schillinger. We will be leading you in the call to worship today. Please follow me in the bolded portion of your bulletin. Though many places in the world are burdened by the pain of a pandemic, the peace of God is poured out for all people. Though discord and struggle have become factors in the lives of the people, the love of God is lavish on all people. Let us praise the God of love and peace. Let us sing God's song of peace and justice for all people. Amen. Oh, hear my song, 
let Christ be lifted up till all shall serve Him. And once united, learn to live as one. For hear my prayer. Hello friends, Pastor Pat here, and it's my pleasure and my privilege to share the opening prayer with you this morning and to encourage you to use this opening prayer as an opportunity to center yourself and prepare for worship. Let us be in an attitude of prayer. Abba, Father, we praise you. Through your boundless grace and mercy, we have been set free, free from the controlling power of sin free from a way of life that leads only to death, free from hopelessness and fear. Not only that, but through your Holy Spirit, we have been invited into your family, adopted as your very own sons and daughters, children of God and made heirs of your glory. And so, no matter what comes our way, we live in confidence and hope eagerly anticipating the day when all of creation will be made new, when justice shall roll down like a mighty river and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And then we shall see you face to face and proclaim, Abba, Father, we praise you. Amen. Today, the New Testament reading is Romans 8, 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it isn't an obligation to ourselves to live our lives on the basis of selfishness. If you live on the basis of selfishness, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the actions of the body, you will live. All who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons and daughters. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery to lead you back again into fear, but you received a spirit that shows you are adopted as his children. With this spirit we cry, Abba, Father. The same spirit agrees with our spirit that we are God's children, but if we are children, we are also heirs. We are God's heirs and fellow heirs with Christ. If we really suffer with him so that we can also be glorified, with him. The word of life. Thanks be to God. If you had an opportunity to worship with us during our last sermon series on 1 John, and I know our friends at Manitou UMC got to join us for the first Sunday in that series, our scripture reading for today might have you thinking, oh no, here we go again with all that heavy children of God theology. If Pastor Alyssa starts talking about love again, I really thought we were done with all of that. Well, we are done with the love stuff, but we only got one week's reprieve from the children of God stuff while we celebrated Pentecost. It turns out that the author of 1 John isn't the only New Testament epistle writer who was concerned with the children of God. Paul also had some things to say to and about the children of God that he was working with during his ministry. In this case, it's the church in Rome that he established, and like John, he wants to make sure that he's helping them establish the right relationship between themselves and God and between themselves and others, which is why he refers to them as children of God, just like John did, to remind them that God is the parent and they are the kids. God holds the role of nurturing us, guiding us, protecting us, and so forth, just like a human parent. And we kids? Our job is to respect, listen to, and follow God's instructions so we can grow up to be righteous, holy, and loving members in the family of God. Which is why Paul also refers to the Christians in Rome in the same way John did to his audience, as brothers and sisters. By naming them as such, Paul reminds them that they not only have a familial relationship to each other, they have an equal relationship to each other. They have all been adopted by God into God's family. They're no longer strangers to one another. They're no longer insiders or outsiders. Their individual status as children of God 
compels them to recognize each other as part of this family and treat each other as such. Because for Paul, being a Christian means accepting the obligation to be a part of a whole, to no longer live as an individual focused solely on the self. Instead, Christians are called to share in a communal identity as members of the family of God and to communicate and to relate to each other with love, trust, and respect, born out of an acknowledgement that every sibling in Christ is an heir of the same spirit that Jesus received at his own baptism. And here's where Paul deviates theologically from 1 John. Thank goodness. For Paul, it's all about the Holy Spirit when it comes to living a life in God. Without the Spirit, Christians would be adrift in the world without a sense or direction or purpose. Which is why right after Jesus ascended to heaven, the Spirit was sent down on Pentecost to serve as our guide and our means by which we stay connected to God and to each other. It's a great mystery how the Holy Spirit works, but scripture teaches us, as does the tradition of the church and even our own personal experience, that the Spirit serves as God's present within us and is the power by which God is revealed to us and becomes present to us. In our scripture reading for today, Paul endeavors to teach the Romans some of the ways in which the Spirit enables them to be in relationship with God and with each other. He has two main points. First, the Spirit provides unity in the body of Christ through our shared identity as children of God. And two, the Spirit leads us to put to death the actions of the body. Let's start with unity. As I've already talked about a few moments ago, it's the Spirit that leads us on the path to belonging in the family of God. At our baptisms, when we claim our faith and dedicate ourselves to following Christ, the Holy Spirit descends upon us, as she did at Jesus' baptism, to claim us as God's beloved child and equip us for ministry. This claim demonstrates our individual adoption by God and declares our new corporate status among the many children of God. From this shared identity, Paul asserts that Christians all across the spectrum of human diversity can experience unity with one another and with God because the Spirit initiates the way to this unity and sustains it within the body of Christ. You might recall this theme popping up in another of Paul's letters, where he writes to the church in Galatia saying, you are all God's children through faith in Christ Jesus. All of you were baptized into Christ and have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's no male or female, for you are all one in Jesus Christ. And now if you belong to Christ, then indeed you are Abraham's ascendants, heirs according to the promise. Sounds a lot like our reading for today, don't you think? Paul was pretty consistent theologically, it turns out. And unity within the body of Christ was a really big deal for him. Pick any letter from Paul to any of the churches that he planted, and you'll find the message of unity among the body of Christ embedded somewhere. And this isn't just because Paul likes a good theme because Paul had figured out that as soon as you gather a group of people together, a group of uniquely gifted and diverse people, you tend to get some conflict. People have different opinions about how to talk about Jesus, how to interpret scripture, how to organize for mission, and more. If you read further into Romans, you'll learn they were having some issues around a variety of things, like accepting each other, whether you were Jewish or Gentile, what to do about governing authorities, taxes, and even personal dietary choices. While Paul acknowledges that differences in origin, practice, opinion, and more existed within the Christian churches he established, he firmly believed that it should be no barrier to unity in the church because everyone who was a Christian received a new shared identity with each other through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, as demonstrated on Pentecost, is pretty good at bringing everybody together for shared mission and ministry despite any differences they may possess. Another struggle Paul observed among his Christian converts, and honestly in himself, was the daily struggle between the will of the flesh, in other words, our physical bodies, and the will of the spirit. In more places than I can explore in one sermon, Paul addresses the challenge of living in a human body with all its needs and demands, frailties and failings, while also being an indwelling of the Holy Spirit with all her needs and demands, strengths and sanctifying powers. The human body worries about things like, what will we wear, what will we eat, where will we sleep? While the Spirit is singularly focused on sanctifying the body of Christ for the fulfillment of God's mission and ministry for all the world. It's a pretty big task. For Paul, though, the Spirit was certainly up for it, and specifically sent to make it happen. Without God, Paul recognized that Christians fall prey to the temptations of the self all too easily, 
to the detriment of their own righteousness and the mission of the church. Whether it's power, wealth, ego, or status, even the influence of principalities and authorities, the lure of satisfying personal needs and focusing on the amplification of the self is a constant presence in our world. Paul knew that the only antidote to this was the presence of the Holy Spirit within us, whose powers of sanctification work to negate the powers of the self and replace it with a sense of belonging in and obligation to the family of God and to provide a way forward into service to God's mission. The only problem with Paul's approach to all this is that he tended to be pretty either or, as we read about in our scripture today. He clearly states, either you, quote, live on the basis of selfishness and die, or you put to death the actions of the body and live. There's not a lot of wiggle room with Paul. And yet any, and I would say all of us, who have navigated the Christian life with a human body know that most of the time we fall somewhere between living selfishly and living selflessly on a pretty daily basis. As they say, the struggle is real, and none of us is exempt from the constant pull of our body's demands for self-satisfying things like food, drink, security, and belonging, all of which is amplified and even distorted by the push and pull of society's demands and expectations of what we should look like to fit in, what we should do to fit in, and what we should say to fit in. But as Christians, we also feel the pull of the Spirit to love one another as God loved us, to accept each other unequivocally as beloved children of God, and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ wherever we may go, even if it's countercultural. So while Paul's either-or approach might not be achievable right now, this minute, because we can't realistically escape our bodies or remove ourselves from the world in which we live, we can name that struggle, and we can invite the Spirit who is already with us to lead us in the way of God any time we feel that tension arise. Do you think we have any tensions going on right now in the body of Christ about what our physical bodies and society desires right now and where the Spirit might be trying to lead us? I mean, we're only living in a moment of slowly emerging from a worldwide pandemic that has existed for 15 months, forcing us to close down our churches while we physically distance from one another with masks and stay-at-home orders, all the while learning how to transition most of our social interactions to the virtual realm. Anybody feel any tension around that? I know I do. Tension around how to safely resume in-person mission and ministry after all we've been through in the last 15 months? Yeah, I'm feeling that tension. And I know from talking to some of my colleagues like Pastor Tiffany and many of the lay folk at Cheney UMC, that I'm not the only one. We are all facing an unprecedented time in the life of the church where we're being asked to make decisions and commit to safety actions that we have never before had to navigate. We're tasked with making plans to reopen our churches for in-person worship ministry that have to take into consideration the CDC guidelines, which change constantly, the governor's COVID restrictions, which also change constantly, the bishop's new framework, which gives us more flexibility than we've grown used to, as well as our own congregational makeup, the architecture of our facility, the bandwidth of our Wi-Fi. I could go on. We also have to take into consideration vaccinations, such as who can and can't be vaccinated, who is and who isn't, who will be and who won't, and the reality that variants and mutations seem to be popping up all over the globe. On top of all that, there's so much information and misinformation swirling around on a daily basis that it's hard to know what is right and what is wrong, what to do and not do, how to move forward, or if we should just stay put. And it turns out, and just about everybody has an opinion about what we should do, often a different opinion of what we should do or not do as a church, how soon we should do it, whether or not we should mask up, go outside, stick with what we're doing until it's really safe or something else. And we have to name that after such a long time in isolation of staying home and staying safe, of, of hiding behind masks, no one could be blamed for falling prey to the desires of the flesh, which deeply yearn for the healing power of Christian community, replete with all the warm hugs, steady handshakes, and close conversation over coffee. Y'all see now why the Spirit said I should probably scrap that Trinitarian lesson for today and focus on her? She's wise, that Holy Spirit. It turns out that while the theology of the Trinity is very important for the church generally, right now, Paul's message to the Romans about letting the Spirit lead is exactly what we Christians facing our own season of challenges need to hear. 
As we consider how to reopen our doors and offer in-person worship and ministry, we need to be reminded that we don't make those decisions in an individual vacuum of personal choice. In the body of Christ, every decision we make is done so out of an obligation to our shared identity as members of the families of God at Cheney UMC and Manitou UMC. There's no room for selfishness in our conversations about how to make our sacred places of worship safe and accessible for every member of our congregation and for anyone who comes to us seeking a life with Christ. We have to consider that at this time, our children under 12 aren't yet eligible for vaccines and that we have members of every age who can't be vaccinated because of medical conditions and others who at this time are making the choice to remain unvaccinated. We have to take into consideration that even with all the safety measures in place, some of our siblings in Christ will still need to stay at home to stay safe. And we have to continue to offer them ways to engage in worship and ministry through at-home bulletins, virtual platforms, and more. As Paul reminds us, we are all adopted as God's children. And as members of the family of God, we must therefore provide for the spiritual welfare of every member using all the resources at our disposal. But in addition to caring for one another's spiritual welfare, we are also obligated to care for one another's physical well-being. Though Paul did encourage us not to let the desires of our flesh dictate our actions in the world, he did not discourage us from nurturing one another and providing for one another's physical safety. To this end, we have some challenging conversations ahead about continuing to wear masks, how to arrange our seating to provide safe distancing, how to host coffee fellowship outside, and what to do about passing the peace, and yes, hugging. The principalities and authorities of our world might say that we can abandon masks if we're vaccinated, but does that match with our commitment to treating all with equal dignity and respect within the body of Christ? If even one among us is unvaccinated, are we not obliged to do everything in our power to make sure they not only feel welcome at worship, but safe and accepted? Society might tell us that people are on their own if they can't or won't be vaccinated, but does that fit with our Christian value of honoring that everyone is a child of God and has belonging in the family of God? I told you there'd be some challenging conversations ahead. But here's the deal of why this passage from Romans is just what we needed to hear today and why I scrapped my Trinitarian message. The Spirit has been sent to lead us. I truly believe that it is only by the Spirit's leading that we were able to adapt to the impact of this pandemic 15 months ago. With the Spirit's leading, both of our churches figured out how to close the doors of our facilities without closing down our ministries. With the Spirit's leading, we learned how to worship virtually via YouTube, how to study the Bible and join in Christian fellowship on Zoom, and how to stay connected through email, social media, and good old-fashioned snail mail. With the Spirit's leading, we figured out how to celebrate Pentecost, the birth of Christ, and the resurrection at home, and got creative with our music ministries, our youth gatherings, and even things as mundane as the offering. One year plus of disruption to our usual way of doing things, and with the Spirit's leading, our two churches didn't miss a beat. And just as I truly believe that the Spirit's got us through this mess, she will get us out of it. By the Spirit's leading, we will reopen our doors and welcome each other to worship in our sanctuaries, to study the Bible in our classrooms, and share in Christian community in our fellowship halls in time. By the Spirit's leading, we will figure out how to arrange our worship spaces to ensure safety, how to continue to include music and worship without live singing, and how to celebrate the sacraments without removing our masks. And by the Spirit's leading, we will learn how to push our selfish impulses aside and embrace the obligation of adoption as children of God to make our church home safe for everyone so all people can seek new life in Christ no matter what. The Trinity will always be there for us to study. But for this day, for this moment in the life of our churches, for this season of mission and ministry at Cheney and Manitou UMC, we need the reminder that the Spirit has been sent to lead us. So let us go forth from this time of worship, embracing the obligation that is before us, in the sure confidence that we do not go forth alone or without direction. For we are the children of God, we belong to the family of God. The Spirit was sent to be with us and she leads us where we need to go. May we each commit ourselves to letting go of the selfishness that is within us and embrace instead the selflessness and obedience we need to follow. Alleluia. Amen.
us accept each other as Christ accepted us. Teach us as sister, brother, each person to embrace. Be present, Lord, among us and bring us to believe. We all ourselves accepted and meant to love and live. Teach us, O Lord, your lessons as in our daily life we struggle to be human and search for hope and faith. Teach us to care for people, for all, not just for some. be pausing for just a moment to share the pastoral prayer and the Lord's Prayer together. At the end of the prayer, the Lord's Prayer will show up on the screen and I invite you to uh, talk, uh, to pray along with me. Gracious Lord, we dream of a world free of poverty and oppression and we yearn for a world free of vengeance and violence and we pray for your peace. When our hearts ache for the victims of war and oppression, help us to remember that you healed people simply by touching them and give us faith in our ability to comfort and heal bodies and minds and spirits that have been broken by violence. When the injustice of this world seems too much for us to handle, Help us to remember that you fed 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread and two fish. And give us hope that, we ha that what we have to offer will turn out to be enough. When fear of the power and opinions of others tempt us to not speak up for the least among us, help us to remember that you dared to turn over the tables of the money changers and give us the courage to risk following you without counting the cost. And when we feel ourselves filled with anger at those who are violent and oppressive, help us remember that you prayed for those who killed you and give us compassion for our enemies too. When we tell ourselves that we have given all we can to bring peace to this world, help us to remember your sacrifice and give us the miracle of losing a little more of ourselves in serving you and our neighbors. Walk with us, Lord, as we answer your call to be peacemakers. Increase our compassion, our generosity, and our hospitality for the least of your children. Give us the courage, the patience, the serenity, the self-honesty, and the gentleness of spirit that are needed in a world filled with turmoil and terror. It's for your peace and justice that we now pray. Filled with your spirit, using the words Jesus taught us, beginning, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, friends, I invite you to join in the closing hymn, Let There Be Peace on Earth. John, take it away. Friends, thank you for worshiping with us today. It was a joy to once again have Manito UMC with us. Please receive this benediction. As we go from this time of worship, remember this. As followers of Jesus Christ, we have not received a spirit of fear, but one of hope and confidence. For we are children of God, members of God's own family, and heirs with Jesus Christ himself. So go out with joy to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>